Hello, everybody, and welcome back to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. My recording schedule got a little bit off because school started this past week, and I had a pretty full calendar getting everything ready for class, meeting my new graduate teaching assistant, and goofing around with the computer and projector in my classroom. Both of my face-to-face -face classes are in the same classroom, one right after the other, so that's kind of nice. But the first day, of course, everything can't go right. It seems like there's always some kind of technology issue. It's either the batteries in the, um, the batteries are dead in the remote for the projector or something about the computer's not working right. Well, this time it was my PowerPoint slides were not projecting correctly. The, the top and the bottom were getting cut off. So I just went with that for the first day, but then our technology people came and adjusted the projector as much as they could. And I went ahead and reformed reformatted all my slides to be shorter and wider. And in the next class period, um, at least the students could see everything. So that's all taken care of. I know that some of you guys are professors and educators too. So please let me know that I'm not the only one this happens to. <laughs> tell me your stories in the comment section below and tell me how your semester's going. I hope it's off to a good start. At home, we've been tearing down our old deck and building a new one. My husband wanted to fix some wood that had some water damage, and it was the wood on the house where the deck was attached. Um, that deck had probably been on the house for 25 years. We've only lived here for 14 years, but whoever built the deck didn't do the correct waterproofing, so the wood underneath started rotting. So unfortunately, we had to tear down the whole deck to see how much of the, like the base wood along the house needed to be replaced. Um, the good news is that it was only like a six foot section right under the sliding glass doors. So my husband fixed that last weekend and put new wood in there. And then he uh, put the plastic coating to waterproof it. And now this weekend, he's out there building the frame and maybe we'll get to put some of the deck boards on. So we might have our deck finished next weekend. And then the third major life event since school started, or besides school starting and building our deck, is that um, we are dog sitting for our neighbor's dog. They are a young couple who live across the street and they just had a baby a couple of weeks ago. And the young woman's mom came to help with the baby, but she ended up getting shingles and had to go back home. So it's just been super stressful for them getting acclimated to the baby, recovering from childbirth and everything like that. And they were just not having time to spend with their dog or take him for walks or anything. So we volunteered to babysit the dog for as long as they needed. So Walter the dog is staying with us. He is a Golden Retriever Poodle Mix and is about a year old. Um, and we already have a dog, Sonny, who's a Golden Retriever and he's nine years old. But Walter is such a cutie and he and Sonny generally get along really well. So it's been fun having him here. With everything going on lately, I haven't had a ton of time to knit but I recently started a new project that I'm really enjoying. I haven't finished it by any means, I just started it. Um, and it's a baby blanket and a hat set. I'm making this for our neighbors, Walter's parents who just had the baby. Um, this pattern is called Baby Blocks Blanket and Hat Set and the designer is Ingrid Fallon. It's a free pattern that you can find on Ravelry and the blanket is basically a basket weave pattern created with blocks of stockinette and reverse stockinette stitch surrounded by a seed stitch border. Um, the finished blanket will measure 36 inches square, so it's a reasonable project that shouldn't take that long to finish. Now the yarn I'm using is Kramer Yarns Tatami Tweed Worsted. It is 40% cotton and 60% acrylic, and it's easy care, machine wash, and tumble dry. Plus, it's nice and soft. That's why I like it for baby items. And I just love the Kramer Yarn Company. They are a family-run business in Pennsylvania and make all their yarns at their textile production facility right there in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. 
Anyway, um, Tatami Tweed has been one of my favorite yarns of theirs. It comes in skeins of 180 yards and 100 grams. Like the name says, it is a tweed, so it has the little nups in it. The colorway I'm using is called Sleepyhead, and it is a pretty uh, lavender with little green tweedy nups throughout it. Now it is kind of loosely spun, so it can be splitty when you knit with it. Just be aware of that. But I really like this yarn and it's great for baby stuff. Now I'm excited to say that the needles that I'm using are a US size 8 or 5 millimeter Chow Gu interchangeables. Um, I'm not excited that they're a size 8. I'm excited that they're my Chow Gu interchangeables because they're not an interchangeable set, but I just bought some of the short three and a half inch tips in various sizes and then bought some of the spin cords so they have that swivel join and the swivel join just means that the needle tip will freely spin which makes it less likely that the cable will get twisted or get kinks in it. Now you'll notice that the spin cords are not red like the regular Chow Gu twist cords are but the twist cords don't have the swivel join and that's why I bought the spin cords separately. So the spin cords are clear, thinner, and more flexible than the red twist cords are and I really do like them. So these are everything I love in a circular needle. Short tips made out of metal, sturdy, stainless steel, they're very pointy, they have the swivel join and the thin flexible cable that doesn't kink up. If you watched my video from a few months ago where I reviewed 10 different interchangeable needle sets, you know that these are my favorite characteristics of circular knitting needles. And if you didn't catch that video yet, I'll put a link to, the, to it in the description box below in case you're interested. So yeah, this is the beginning of my Baby Blocks blanket. And again, the pattern is by Ingrid Fallon. I haven't done a book review for a while, and I recently finished listening to a good audiobook that I thought I would share with you. This is a brand new book entitled On Her Majesty's Frightfully Secret Service by Reese Bowen. This is the 11th book in the Royal Spinous Mystery Series, one of my favorite cozy mystery series, and it was just released on August 1st. When I found out back in July that it was scheduled to come out, I went ahead and pre-ordered it, so I got it as soon as it was available. In addition to being a, in the cozy mystery genre, um, it's also historical fiction because this series is set in the 1920s and 1930s and is based on the real British royal family at that time, Queen Mary and King George VI. Their eldest son, Prince David, is also included in these stories. And if you're familiar with this uh, time frame in the history of British royalty, you'll know that David was romantically involved with the unpopular American socialite Wallace Simpson, and he eventually ended up abdicating the throne to marry her. But in this book, that hasn't happened yet. David is just keeping company with her, to his parents' chagrin. <laughs> So that's the historical part. Um, the fictional part is that the main character in this series is Lady Georgiana, or Georgie, a young woman who is 34th in line for the throne. <laughs> she is a favorite of the queen and is often invited to Buckingham Palace to have tea with her. So at the beginning of this book, Georgie receives a letter from the queen inviting her to the palace for a visit. Now, we know from the previous books in this series that Georgie's visits with the Queen are not just social in nature. The Queen always seems to have an ulterior motive. She always wants Georgie to, to help her with something. And this time, she wants Georgie to spy on Prince David and Wallace Simpson to make sure they're not planning to elope. So she makes arrangements for Georgie to attend a house party in Italy that the Prince and Wallace Simpson are going to be attending. And then coincidentally, Georgie also receives a letter from her best friend, Belinda, who is also in Italy. So Georgie travels from England to Italy to both visit her friend and attend this house party to spy on the prince. 
And as it turns out, the house party is being hosted by a former schoolmate of Georgie's. Other guests at the lavish estate, besides Prince David and Wallace Simpson, include Georgie's American mother, Claire, and her wealthy German husband, Max. There are also several German military officers, as well as an assistant to Benito Mussolini, who are party guests. Um, Georgie's fiance, Darcy, is in residence as well, undercover and posing as an English gardener. So among the varied cast of characters at this house party, something sinister is happening. Just as the party is getting underway, one of the guests is found murdered and everyone seems to have a motive. Georgie's mother becomes the chief suspect. The police sequester all of the guests at the villa while the investigation goes on. Now Georgie has her hands full as she tries to find the real killer and the true purpose of why Mussolini's assistant and the Nazi generals are in attendance. Um, the book's author, Reese Bowen, does a great job of weaving historical facts and, and fiction effortlessly into a compelling story over a background of the mounting threat of fascism in Europe. She somehow keeps it lighthearted, all the while capturing the essence of the German, Italian, and British people, as well as the turbulent uh, events and precarious political climate leading up to the Second World War. The dialogues are perfect and faithful to the era, with serious and sober underpinnings. Yet, there's mayhem galore, with several fun moments, usually revolving around Georgie's spying almost being discovered. There were several plausible murder suspects, and I wasn't sure who was going to be revealed as the perpetrator. But in a fabulous way, Bowen ties up the impossible situation with grace, style, and well-written characters. I would definitely recommend this book, it is a standalone book that you could read without having read the entire series. It's fairly easy to pick up enough background information in the first few chapters if you're unfamiliar with the series. But once you read this book, you're probably going to want to go back and read the whole series to find out the nuances of the backstory. So looming on Georgie's horizon are many fascinating historical events like the Berlin Olympics, the death of King George VI and the subsequent abdication crisis, and World War II. It will be interesting to see how these events play out in future books in the series. And then there is Georgie's upcoming wedding to Darcy. I'm really looking forward to the next book, but since this one just came out, we'll probably have to wait a little while. I'm giving this one four stars. And the reader, Catherine Kellegren, is magnificent. She is such a talented voice actress and maintains the same voices for all these different recurring characters throughout the entire series. It's amazing. She always gets five stars from me. And again, that book is On Her Majesty's Frightfully Secret Service by Reese Bowen. Today in the classroom, I thought it would be interesting to explore the topic of obsessive knitting or a knitting addiction. A lot of us joke around about being addicted to knitting or crocheting or quilting or whatever your craft is. And I got to thinking, is there really something to that? Can someone be addicted to knitting? Well, until recently, the science and profession of psychology has focused primarily on human weaknesses and mental illness, so it's been pretty negative in orientation. Much of the research and practice in psychology has presented a fairly pessimistic view of human nature where things like anxiety, depression, hostility, and conflict have overshadowed the studies of positive things like joy, hope, love, and peace. 
We have expended a lot of energy to understanding psychopathology and trying to, to repair what is wrong with people. And of course, by doing this, we've learned a lot about why people become depressed and anxious and suffer from other mental health issues, as well as new methods of treatment for fixing these problems. This focus is undoubtedly the reason why most people think all psychologists are counselors or therapists. And this is definitely not an accurate perception. And besides this misconception about psychologists, when it comes to research on how people thrive, flourish, and become happy, we don't know that much about it. We've kind of neglected the positive side of human nature. Now, don't get me wrong, things like happiness, altruism, and positive behavior have been studied. It's just that the research has historically been lopsided toward the negative. But about 20 years ago, Martin Seligman, who was then president of the American Psychological Association, called for a more positive psychology, one that would balance the investigation of human weaknesses with studies of human strength, virtue, and satisfaction with life. This emerging area is called positive psychology and is all about measuring, understanding, and fostering characteristics that make us happy. So here's a question for you. Imagine that someone could grant you either fame and fortune or happiness. You could have the world's respect and own everything you could dream of, but without happiness. Or you could live each day joyfully but having only your basic needs met. Which would you choose? Happiness or fame and fortune? Well, studies show that for virtually everyone, it's no contest. Happiness wins hands down. Without a doubt, people want happiness over fame and fortune. In fact, most people pursue fame and fortune simply because they think it will make them happy. So how happy are people? Well, it seems that Americans, at least, are pretty happy. In one survey, a whopping 92% of Americans picked a happy face when selecting an expression that conveys how they feel about their life as a whole. A recent Harris poll reported that over 90% of Americans reported satisfaction with their life. In fact, in another study, the participants thought they themselves were happier than popular and powerful people like Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey, and the Pope. And research shows that it's good to be happy. The benefits of being happy extend beyond the enjoyment of good feelings. In Martin Seligman's own research, he found that relative to gloomy people, happy people are healthier and live longer, they're more productive at work and have higher incomes, they're more tolerant and creative and make decisions more easily, they select more challenging goals, persist longer, and perform better at a variety of tasks, and they have more empathy, more close friends, and better marriages. Now, there's probably nothing surprising here, although we aren't sure if happiness actually causes good health, productivity, and other benefits, or whether these positive behaviors cause people to be happy. All that we know is that they just go hand in hand. We all know the saying, you can't buy happiness. And studies confirm that striving to become rich, famous, and attractive actually decreases happiness. Yet in a survey from the University of Michigan, people were asked what would most improve the quality of their life, and the most frequent answer was more money. In another survey, nearly 75% of respondents said that being financially well off was an essential goal in life. Wealth was ranked well ahead of raising a family, developing a meaningful philosophy of life, or becoming an authority in one's field. Other research in the area of positive psychology involves the study of optimism, or the belief that, in general, good things are likely to happen. Optimists tend to see goals as attainable, and so they're more likely to persist at striving for those goals and not give up on their efforts. 
There's a lot of research showing that people who are optimistic reap benefits in many spheres of life. Romantic relationships, friendships, physical health, mental health, work, education. In romantic relationships, optimistic couples report more relationship satisfaction, more happiness, fewer disagreements, and better problem solving than pessimistic couples. Friendships between optimistic individuals tend to have lower conflict and higher levels of social support. In medical studies, optimistic people tend to be more calm and engage in more healthy habits. Optimists seem to be better at regulating their mood and are less susceptible to burnout than pessimists. In occupational settings, optimists have been found to make more money, have higher job satisfaction, and more commitment to their employers than pessimists. Finally, the connection between optimism and education indicates that optimists tend to get better grades, study harder for exams, and are less likely to give up. They are more likely to make new friends and ask for help when they need it. Now, there's a researcher at Claremont Graduate School named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who is well known for weighing in on the positive psychology issue. And let me just pause here to address his name because it definitely looks like it doesn't have enough vowels and is unpronounceable. But despite the scary spelling, it is pronounced Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And Csikszentmihalyi agrees that people are not happy because of what they do, but because of how they do it. He proposes that a state of consciousness called flow is what makes people happy and their experiences genuinely satisfying. This idea is reflected in a quote from American novelist Willa Cather. This is happiness, to be dissolved into something completely great. Consider your own experiences with flow. Have you ever been involved in something? Maybe knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving? Involved with it so deeply that nothing else seemed to matter and you lose track of time? This is the concept of flow, which Csikszentmihalyi formulated after studying artists who worked with enormous concentration and found their work so enjoyable and engrossing that they lost track of time and nothing else mattered. In his subsequent research on ordinary people, Csikszentmihalyi found that 20% of respondents said they experience flow often, as much as several times a day. Flow can come in doing practically anything, from knitting, to playing touch football, to repairing an appliance, to preparing dinner, even driving a car. Now, Csikszentmihalyi said there are nine qualities that characterize flow experiences. First, the situation must be challenging, but not too much. This is like a knitting pattern. Too challenging leads to anxiety. Not challenging enough leads to boredom. Second, the activity becomes automatic. Again, using knitting as an example, an experienced knitter does not have to pay attention to every stitch. Third, there are clear goals. So with knitting, your goal might be to learn a new stitch or maybe just finish the pattern. Fourth, immediate and clear feedback is given. With knitting, you can look at your piece or count the stitches and see if you've made a mistake. And if so, you can correct it. Fifth, concentration. There is a total focus on the task. So you might be completely engrossed in your knitting project. Sixth, you have a sense of being in control. So you are the boss of your knitting. Seventh, there's a loss of self-consciousness. So it's like when you're knitting, you don't worry about yourself, your appearance, what people think of you. Eighth, you lose track of time. When working on an appropriately challenging and engrossing project, time is out of your awareness. When you're in flow, Time seems to fly by faster than normal. And ninth, you're intrinsically motivated to perform the task. Like with knitting, 
You're not getting some kind of external reward. You're doing it because you enjoy it. Now, many activities have been identified as being conducive to flow, such as playing sports, running, dancing, sex, reading, and knitting, and other creative arts and hobbies. Activities like doing housework and watching TV rarely produce flow, probably because they are not very challenging. The interesting thing is that activities that produce flow can vary across cultures. For example, child rearing often produces flow in gypsy culture, but not anywhere else. In Western culture, leisure activities like knitting are most often related to flow states. So how can we relate the experience of flow to the idea of being addicted to knitting? Well, there's actually a theory of positive addiction, which was proposed by um, a psychiatrist named William Glasser back in 1976. His ideas were pretty non-traditional. He believed that mental illness was only present when there's some physical problem with the brain, which can be confirmed by a pathologist. In all other cases, he proposed that psychological struggles stem from an individual's inability to get along with important people in their lives. Because he said, we're naturally social beings and problems with our relationship have a huge effect on us. In other words, our mental health is, to a large degree, tied to the quality of the connections we have with other people. He applied this idea to education, parenting, the judicial system, and even addictions. When it comes to addictions, the question is, is the behavior unhealthy and a way to escape one's relationships? Or is it healthy and a way to empower the person and bolster their relationships? In 1976, Glasser wrote a book called Positive Addictions, where he described how people can be addicted to an activity that is actually good for them. Initially, his research on positive addiction was limited to runners. After surveying runners, he concluded that the act of running could bring the runner into a special mental state where contentment, confidence, and creativity flourished. The runners admitted that if they could run with ease for about an hour, and if they weren't competing with anyone, they would experience a transcendent, trance-like, meditative state where the mind could be free. And this strengthened them and made them feel better. Now today we have a term for this, we call this experience runner's high, and it seems to be very pervasive among runners. The runners also admitted that when they didn't run for a while, they began to feel less healthy, both physically and emotionally, and they were motivated to get back to running again. So flow and positive addictions have a lot in common. They both produce states of ultimate enjoyment, but do require work and effort, at least to begin with. Glasser argued that activities such as jogging were positive addictions and were the kind of activity that could be deliberately cultivated to wean addicts away from more harmful behaviors. He hypothesized that other activities besides running could be positive addictions, like doing yoga, meditating, playing a musical instrument, writing in a diary, singing, dancing, exercising, and even knitting, as long as certain conditions are met. Now, in his book, he outlines six requirements that must be satisfied in order for an activity to be considered a positive addiction. And those are First, it is something non-competitive that you choose to do for approximately an hour a day. Second, it is possible for you to do it easily and without a lot of mental effort. Third, you can do it alone or sometimes with others, but you don't depend on others to do it. Fourth, you believe that it has some physical, mental, or spiritual value to you. Fifth. You believe that if you persist at it, you will improve. 
And sixth, you do the activity without criticizing yourself. So you can see that these requirements overlap a whole lot with the requirements for a flow experience. In fact, some psychologists have incorporated the idea of flow into the idea of positive addictions. One researcher even defines positive addiction as flow states that are repeated often enough to induce cravings for them and withdrawal if halted. The idea of positive addiction has actually been put into practice with knitting. Dr. Katherine Duffy, a licensed clinical social worker in Philadelphia, published a study in 2008 about using knitting as a method for managing stress and emotions in recovering addicts. Her study was conducted with female addicts at a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center. The results of the study showed that the knitting program was beneficial in moderating stress and negative emotions both for inpatient and outpatient clients. A similar program called Knit to Quit is being conducted out of Toronto, Ontario in Canada. They are using knitting to help people cope with quitting smoking, as well as a variety of other health-related issues like chronic pain, ADHD, cancer, post-traumatic stress disorder, and motor skill impairment. Academically, there is not much research on knitting addiction, but I did find one study that examined knitting practice in Korea, and this was published in 2011. The, re the results revealed that immersion in knitting projects can become so intense as to create anxiety for some knitters after the completion of a knitting project. Knitters confessed a sense of emptiness or feeling lost after a period of deep mental and physical engagement. Now the authors concluded that knitting can be a type of addiction where the knitter feels bored and empty with a sense of being lost when they finish the project. Now, a lot of psychologists argue that it is possible for an individual to become addicted to anything if there are constant rewards. And this can include both positive and negative behaviors that are rewarded somehow. It also implies that any positive addiction done to excess in which it causes physical harm, emotional distress, relationship problems, financial difficulties, and so on, can become a negative addiction. And there's quite a bit of research showing how this can happen with things like exercising, running, uh, playing video games, gambling, and surfing the internet. The traditional components of addiction include things like withdrawal symptoms, mood changes, relapse, and conflict. So once the short-term benefits of a behavior are outnumbered by the long-term downsides, it is considered a negative addiction. Even Csikszentmihalyi admits that flow experiences are not always good. Gambling, for example, especially games like bridge or poker, has all the conditions necessary for flow. They're challenging and require a high level of skill to stand any chance of winning. Activities like mountain climbing, chess, or PlayStation can become addictive so much that life without them can feel boring and meaningless. Even a simple game like solitaire on your computer, which many people use to relax for a few minutes, can take over your life. This happens when a flow-inducing activity becomes a necessity rather than a choice. We talk about people becoming workaholics, meaning that they might lose themselves in flow at work until late at night, forgetting to go home, to spend time with the family, having dinner, or saying goodnight to the children. Even activities like knitting and crocheting can have negative aspects. Doing them too much can lead to repetitive motion injuries like carpal tunnel syndrome or exacerbation of arthritis symptoms. So, whether you call an experience flow or a positive addiction, it has the potential to make life more rich, intense, and meaningful. These behaviors are good because they increase the strength and complexity of the self. 
but we have to be able to manage the activity, making sure that it enhances our life and that we're able to let go when necessary. Now, researcher Martin Seligman laments how the hustle and bustle of life and our constant focus on the future help us from savoring the present moment. So if you have a positive addiction and can induce a flow experience and appreciate the here and now, this is a good thing because savoring contributes directly to well-being and happiness. In a world where technological advances like food processors, bread machines, and even audiobooks have deprived us of many of life's tactile pleasures, The feeling of nice yarn and the steady repetition of stitch after stitch can be a restorative tonic that produces something real and tangible. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about positive psychology, flow, and positive addictions. Did you learn anything new? What are your reactions to this area of research? What are your experiences with flow? Do you think crafting is a positive addiction for you? I always love hearing from viewers. Please share your experiences and thoughts in the comment section below. And also, please leave comments if you have any questions about today's show, or if you have an idea for what you'd like to see on future episodes, or if you'd like to see a product tested. I always enjoy reading your questions and ideas and I'm constantly adding to my list of topics for future videos. And that's great because that means there will be many videos to come. So leave your questions and suggestions in the comment section below. And I will include links to everything I've talked about in this video in the information box below so you can go check them out if you're interested. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and I'll see you in the next video. Now, before I go, I wanted to mention that this video marks the 24th episode in the U University YouTube series. And if you've watched for a while, you might remember that I record sets of eight videos and then take a break to give me time to prepare new material and shoot some new video footage. So that's what I'm going to be doing for the next few weeks. U University will be on fall break until the beginning of October. I'll be back on October 9th with a new episode and you can look forward to some exciting new topics that viewers have requested and I hope you will enjoy. In the meantime, take care everybody and have a sparkly week or a sparkly month.